Hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to Zero Books and Repeater Media. We've got a fantastic interview today, but I, uh, I need to issue a little disclaimer. Towards the end of the interview, my microphone cut out and everything started to break down a little bit. So, uh, so much for tech optimism. So when the audio ends abruptly, please just imagine me shouting at my laptop while still thinking about poppers. I didn't get a chance to plug Adam's book at the end of the recording, uh, so uh, I really can't recommend Deep Sniff Enough, published with Repeater. Um, you can get it on Repeater's website or, of course, through your local radical bookshop. Uh, thanks a lot and apologies again for the meltdown of techno-capitalistic production or something. The labels declare a name for each small bottle. Jungle Juice, Everest, Blue Boy, Iron Horse, Double Scorpio, Oink. Only symbols differentiate them. Typography, color, design, illustration, trademarks, trade dress. The actual substances inside these bottles are obscured from us. Isoamyl nitrate, isobutyl nitrate, isopropyl nitrate, isopentyl nit nitrate. A technique called proton nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy can identify the mix of liquids inside each bottle. But the invisible vapor rising from them is the only thing that counts. Iron Horse is just a show. When you unscrew that lid, you smell their notes. You feel the effect pulse through you. Welcome to Zero Books and Repeater Media. I'm Will, and today I'm joined by Adam Smith to talk about his book, Deep Sniff, A History of Poppers and Queer Futures, published with Repeater Books. Adam is a writer and producer who writes on queerness, desire, queer futures, and LGBTQ history. Deep Sniff, published in 2021, narrates a chemical history of queer life and ultimately makes a case for pleasure beyond restriction. Adam, welcome. It's really, really great to have you on. Thank you for having me. Ah, so, um, I mean, you mentioned in this book, um, just for those who haven't heard of it, perhaps, that it emerged out of a talk that you initially gave in 2019, this book here. Yes, but... um, I wonder if maybe you could just start by saying a little bit about what led you to give that talk in the very, very, very first place? And so to an extent, what the kind of underlying motivation behind this book is? Well, I just realized that I was sniffing poppers when I was having sex and other people were doing that, that I knew that I was having sex with. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's quite common uh, among people that have more amongst people that have certain kinds of sex, like men that have sex with each other. Um, and so I so I kind of knew that, but I was like, well, we I don't really know anything about <laughs> this. And um, the people, uh, like people around me, friends, whatever, didn't know very much either. And so like I would, so I Googled, you know, like history of poppers, like what is poppers? And I got the same set of, like four or five facts. There were a few different articles back then that all seemed to regurgitate the same facts. Like it was a, um, originally a medicine for angina patients in the 19th century. Mm. And um, there was this doctor who found it. And then um, here are some pictures of some adverts uh, from the 70s when it became a product um, but it was all quite superficial and it was the same facts reproduced in the same online articles uh, it, I mean well different online articles but the same facts and so I just thought that was a bit weak <laughs> yeah for <laughs> and, sure um, pretty superficial so um, I just thought well there's probably lots to look into there and I was interested in that scientific history the medical history um, because it seemed quite some distance away from me sniffing this product now uh when i was horny um and fucking like it's like the yeah. Victorian era seems a long way away like like a hospital bed seems a long way away from yeah from sniffing and fucking so i just thought there's plenty to look into and uh, I was working with a collective, I'm um, part of a collective that organise a queer film and arts festival in London every year. And some of the folks in that said to me, like, what do you want to do for the festival this year? And normally I'm like, 
organizing events, like producing arts events with with that, um, book talks and stuff like that. And I said, well, I want to write my own talk and give a talk at the festival about the history of poppers because yeah. I want to investigate that. Can I do that? And they said yes. And so that was great because it gave me a deadline and a reason to produce something. So that was um, really where it started was um, being motivated by the gaps, basically, in my own knowledge and what was known that was well known about it. And then having a like a specific reason and a date where, OK, let's put on this event. I'll write a talk for it. And then we've got to sell tickets. So yeah, that was where that was that was 2019. Yeah, and it, it, it I mean, it, what was so interesting to me when I when you started right when I started reading the book was when people talk about the history of poppers, the thing that they immediately want to go to is like, well, what's the kind of official, mm. you know, w- when did the, when was this an official thing, and when did it become a weird, you know, queer thing, right? Mm. So when someone says the history of poppers, they would always say, oh, it was initially a medicine. This is how it's got its name, but very, mm. very little, it seemed to me, was talking about the the actual history of poppers as a social phenomenon, which is kind, yeah. of, kind of difficult, difficult yeah. to explain, and I'm sure we'll get on to talking about it. But yeah. I suppose for those um, who are unfamiliar, um, and I'd say potentially uninitiated, it'd be helpful for us to say what poppers actually are, because I feel that potentially, yeah. if people have heard of them, they don't really know what it's what they are, what they do. Yeah. Um, certainly, yeah. a lot of what your book about is about people misunderstanding what they are and what they do so perhaps you know what are they chemically what are they socially what do they do what are they for yeah well it's the poppers is you know the popular name the street name for a collection of um substances which could also call um the the chemical name of that collection is alkyl nitrites and they are um the first one synthesized was amyl nitrite uh, in 1844 and that was the thing that became the medicine and it's um just a liquid that is kind of um kind of translucenty yellowy not quite clear like kind of more clear than yellow but um uh, but that's what it is and then it gives off at room temperature it's always giving off a vapor and um that's why when you buy poppers then you um the it's uh the it's it's a bottle of liquid and you don't want the liquid you want the vapor that's the thing that you sniff but you want to keep the top on the bottle when you're not using it because otherwise the vapor is just escaping because it's that's what it's doing at room temperature uh and so um uh yeah it's basically like a really simple uh, chemical that is a liquid at room temperature, which is always vaporizing. And what the effect is when you sniff it is that it um, uh, reduces your, uh, sorry, dilates your blood uh, vessels, um, which lowers your blood, um, lowers your blood pressure so that more blood is going through the body. That means more oxygen gets to your brain. So you get a bit like high and a bit of a head rush because your brain loves oxygen. And then also muscles really love having lots of blood because it relaxes them. If you're going to have sex in your bum, uh, then that having your muscles relaxed is particularly useful. Um, but it does also work vaginally um, on the vaginal muscles as well. And um, uh, uh, also gives you like a bit of a kind of a, you get a bit hot. Uh, you can get a bit flushed. So some of the early... Uh, scientific observations of the effect of sniffing amyl nitrite was that the um, that people get flushed and they get sort of red cheeks and that's um, written down by the Victorian scientists that were just trying it out, writing about it, or giving it to their friends and um, and, and trying it. Um, and so that's that's really all it is. Um, it was originally sold in these little glass ampules that you would crush between your hand uh, between your fingers and your fist to release the vapor and that crushing sound of that tiny glass ampule uh made a pop which is the reason why we have the name poppers that's where it comes from even though they're now sold primarily as tiny little glass bottles with a screw cap so there's no popping noise anymore yeah, I, I had heard this kind of apocryphal story that it was because the bottle used to used to be sealed with something that was made of pop, which was kind of, I don't know why. There, it's yeah. one of these things where, as I said, that there are just so many apocryphal stories about it because I think yeah. people assume that the stories are going to be weird and coincidental when yeah. actually 
yeah. you know, the main thing that struck me about it is that the stories are kind of quite sensible and quite interesting, right? They kind of, they follow a kind of logic that kind yeah. of, you go, yeah, that, that's kind of how I would expect it to happen, right? Um, yeah. Is like the invention of anything, right? Some Victorian guy generally, um, or, you know, discovers something, something which does something yeah. interesting, and then all of a sudden, uh, it becomes it becomes useful for for yeah. something else. I mean, yeah. and then I mean, obviously, the kind of answer to why did they get used on the queer scene, particularly. Uh, the scene mm. for men who have sex with men mm. um, is kind of well, they do something that's useful. But mm. there's but how how what, what were the situation in which this became discovered and the kind of the original well, kind of distributive history of it? Yeah, I wish I knew that, and I don't really. Which is a a, a flaw in the research that I was able to do. Um, I always say if someone wants to give me a research grant to really try to pinpoint the moment and the place and the bedroom where probably someone like a medical student uh, yeah. noticed the effect and took it home and sniffed it when they were having sex, which there are rumours that that was happening among medical students in Harvard in the 1930s or 40s, um, which which would sort of make sense. But um, so we it's hard to pinpoint that exact moment when when it kind of like was started to be used recreationally let's say or sexually um i actually think that's kind of okay um yeah on the one hand it says something broader about the the history that gets preserved um or not preserved and it is often queer histories mm. and sexual histories that are not preserved uh in official archives or um even in accounts um, mm. or anything like that because of you know things like shame and stigma uh and uh repression and privacy and often censorship and all of those things um so so it says something about the what what we preserve um as part of our communal history but also uh I also kind of sort of like the fact that there's a great mystery about who did mm. that and when, um, because I think that it's there's something quite um, nice and freeing about the fact that we, um, we, you know, there's so much about our bodies that we don't know and what our bodies are capable of and and how we can enjoy them, and that it's it's always up to the individual to discover that. And so I, that's one of the things that I quite like that you can do when you're making piece of work about history is you can leave those gaps because I think that um, too much in life is definitive. We try too hard to be certain about things. Um, and I think when it comes to sex and human society, like we can't be certain about a lot of things and that's okay. Um, but we know definitely that um, by the 60s, uh, very frequently in London, San Francisco, in New York, men that were having sex with each other were going to pharmacies uh, and telling the pharmacist that they were having heart problems or angina and could they please buy some amyl nitrite. And um, that was fairly easy if you knew where to go and how to do that. And also in those cities, it was often well known that there were certain pharmacies that um, were very like able to sell that to you and not ask you any questions. Like, hang in a minute, like you're the 17th man who's only 25 who seems to have angina problem that we've seen today you know <laughs> there were certain yeah. pharmacists that just didn't ask that question because they knew they knew what these people were doing um and so uh that was for sure happening in the in the 60s um well and into the 70s uh and that's when it started when companies started to form to actually manufacture it and sell it outside the pharmacy um you know, just to sell it through the gay newspapers, gay networks, uh, nightclubs, and places like that. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's. So one thing that that struck me about the way that you were using those gaps in the history um, was that Popper's kind of took on this place in the narrative, almost like this kind of. I don't know why I thought this thought of this, and I'm sorry if this is at all. Uh, reductive but almost like a kind of queer forest gump like there's all yeah, these moments yeah, throughout queer true. history where they yeah. just keep they keep popping up like in the yeah. construction of that identity in yeah. the kind of attempted suppression of it and potentially thinking about our futures and i wonder whether we could sort of start by talking 
Mm. It's about, you know, okay, once they sort of became circulated um, in the kind of growth of the kind of a formation of a legitimate queer identity, Mm -hmm. um, which you talk about as basically being this beefcake Mm -hmm. character um, Mm -hmm. in the kind of the 80s. What role did poppers play in that? How much is their consumption kind of affected by that? Mm -hmm. And that was something that really did seem interesting to me. Yeah, well, I think it's um, it's very much a story of capitalism, right? Because yeah. um, the seventies, you know, a lot of the uh, kind of like the, especially in America, the uh, I mean, the USA, the uh, kind of like um, radical pe- young people from the sixties who had like grown up wanting to change the world and imagining a different kind of world. <laughs> a lot of those um, set up. Uh, what became huge businesses, which were world-changing businesses in the 70s. Um, big brands like Microsoft, Apple, Starbucks. Yeah. Uh, and and also um, uh, PacWest Distribution, P- uh, PWD, which was one of the poppers companies. And um, and so uh, there is the possibility, there was the possibility, huge possibility in the 70s in America to like, Um, because it was a period of huge economic growth and like then through the 80s as well like the US and um, and the UK and um, other like industrialized nations um, that uh, basically companies could could grow really big Um, so I think that there's 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 a there's a place for poppers in that history of capitalism but then specifically within it and this is kind of like the most capitalist in a way is how um, com- those companies that saw the market for this product, which was relatively cheap to manufacture uh, and could be sold in high volumes relatively cheaply. So therefore lots of people could afford it, even though it was sure. only a niche um, product, you know, it was primarily gay men. Um, and that gay men were gradually growing as a community, as an identity in places like London, San Francisco and New York. Um, there were gay businesses, there were increasing gay neighborhoods um, and really uh, well-established and developing gay networks. And so there was like very much um, like an entrepreneurial opportunity there uh, to sell products into that growing network and that identity. And also these were people who um, uh, had disposable income, especially Mm. because they were you know, more back then than than now, maybe they were not, it was not necessarily a group that was even thinking about having children or mm. spending money in the conventional ways. Um, so, so it had more disposable income. And so uh, the canny business men uh, thought, okay, well, like, how do we sell this product to these people? Like, what is it that they desire? How do you sell products to people? And of course it's sex, 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 and it's a sex product anyway. And so you look at, um, you know, when you look at the adverts that they used and where they place those adverts, as you said, they are very uh, beefcake-y, pictures of beefcake guys. Um, There was a burgeoning art scene at that time of people like, um, you know, well, I mean, they had been going on since the 40s with Tom of Finland, but that kind of like super erotic, sexualized, masculinist, gay male art. Um, mm. other artists like Rex and Skipper and Etienne, these are all in the USA. Um, they had like developed this like hyper masculine gay erotic art, um, which was like about strength and potency and muscles and stuff, um, but also about getting fucked. And so, uh, the poppers manufacturers used that kind of imagery and that kind of artwork because you know, they knew it was attractive to the people that they were trying to market. And then they placed adverts like that in the gay newspapers, which were really the lifeblood of of the gay community then. Um, Mm. And the, you know, it was the communication network. Um, And so it was this perfect confluence really of of identity and communities getting together, um, of uh, artists that were able to like imagine and see what people desired and then actually to like express that in their work. And then uh, things like newspapers and the um, and the bus- and the the gay businesses that were uh, creating the networks and communities, um, and so that kind of all came together, and that's how we ended up with the Poppers brands being based on potency and power and uh, you know Rush hardware, TNT, um, these like really super like 
strong masculinist ideas. Yeah, and I, and I wonder why then, what is it about that identity that is constructed by poppers that, that retains a sense of, of certainly a deviation from heteronormativity, if we can use that term? Well, because it's um, like, because men want to, because it's men that want to have abs and pecs and muscles and look super manly, but also like get fucked in the bum or fuck another, yeah. man, or fuck another man in the bum. Um, yeah. And so it's like both incredibly conventional on the one hand within the sort of heteropatriarchal construct and also incredibly subversive on the other hand um, by moving away from the previous concept that homosexuality was basically a feminized uh, identity and and a, and a female behavior just encased in men. Yeah, uh, you know it was um, so. It's yeah, it's um, it's a hot mess. But it was what struck me as an interesting moment as well. Just to keep going on this is that there's this moment where one of the marketers of I think it's Rush um, thinks. Well, actually, this can go alongside like vodka <clears throat> or in pardon shampoo, shampoo, like, and alongside shampoo yeah. specifically. <laughs> and I, I, it's, I mean, is it just that by that time it was already associated with queerness, but that that didn't become the case? I don't know. Um, I, think, so I wonder. You know, I'm just imagining that world where that's true. I think you. I think from from. So that's a quote from uh, the person that ran one of the big poppers companies, and he was quoted saying that in like a newspaper article, um, which was about the growth of that industry in the late 70s. And um, and uh, I think that he was really just being like an, a cheeky entrepreneur. You know, he was really just saying like, look, okay. there's nothing like really inherently harmful about this substance. Like people are doing it en masse and it's not causing like huge like medical problems. Yes, there are some um, medical drawbacks to certain kinds of people, just like mm -hmm. most products. Um, but uh, uh, there's, he was just saying that there's no, I don't, he wasn't even, it wasn't even like a gay rights thing. You know, he no, wasn't, no. you know, he wasn't um, saying, you know, like our gay products should be sold alongside normal suburban hetero products. Yeah. Um, he was just, I think just saying like, you know, this, this has the potential to become like a huge product and yeah. it actually has become a huge product and it's big business. Uh, but it's flies under the radar much in the same way that porn is like a super big business, but it's just not very visible. Yeah. I mean, I guess maybe he was right in the sense that it, it is now like commonly accessible, like, you know, it's in corner shops, like if you're in London, in pretty much UK, everywhere yeah. in, in the UK, yeah. maybe not not in the US quite so much. Um, well, I it's definitely know. in sex shops and in and in some corner shops in some cities. Yeah. Um, but uh, but in a lot of countries, it's completely banned. Yeah. Uh, but then it's not often intercepted by customs offices. So like right. in, in individual packets. So people buy it and they just get it mailed to them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, what else? I mean, uh, potentially moving away from this, the slightly more lighthearted stuff. I mean, I a big part of the book is kind of narrating the history of kind of the, the policing of health and the politics of health, of course, in relation to the AIDS um, tragedy of the 1980s mm. um, and, uh, and really the late 20th century, I suppose. Um, I, I was wondering, what did you find... Um, was the relation between poppers and the way that people were thinking about AIDS, the way that people were thinking about the health of mm. um, of queer of queer people mm. and kind of the the possible yeah policing of of that health? What's what was yeah, poppers' so role? There? That was something that I hadn't really expected when no. I started researching. I didn't expect to find like with your Forrest Gump example, that mm. poppers would, would appear in the in the story of HIV AIDS. You know, the story of HIV AIDS as a pandemic starting in the early 80s um, or coming to be known in the early 80s mm. and then, um, you know, ravaging uh, LGBTQ plus communities through the 80s and the 90s. That story is obviously super well told. Mm. Um, it's not always the most inclusive diverse uh 
um, telling of that story. It's often focused on certain kinds of people and stuff, but it's super well told. There's, you know, there's movies, TV shows, a hundred million mm. books about it and stuff. Yeah. Um, and so I, so I, so just like most people, like I know that story really well. I'd also made a, uh, well, actually I was, we were still making it when I was uh, writing the book. Um, I made a podcast series called The Logbooks over three seasons that was a history of LGBT plus life in Britain. And that obviously covered HIV AIDS quite a lot. And so I had interviewed a lot of survivors of that, of the of the 80s. Um, and so I kind of like knew that story really well. Uh, and then just the more I looked into poppers, the more I um, the more poppers came up in that story. Uh, and yet I hadn't heard that aspect of the story. So it is like that Forrest Gump example that you said, like poppers just appeared. And um, the, the way that they appeared really was, was this. Uh, they, um, you know, they fell into uh, the same narrative of um, hostility and ignorance from media politicians and, um, you know, conservative a middle England types, and I mean that not in a geographical sense, I mean it in a, you know, in a sort of like, you know, political mind sense um, in the UK, and then obviously the equivalents in the US as well, and probably other countries. Um, because like, so basically, you know, because um, a HIV and AIDS were related to gay sex, and um, the police had already, through the 70s and into the 80s, had been persecuting men for having sex with each other, in public toilets uh, and charging them with indecent exposure, in, uh, indecent exposure and importuning, which were the two charges that they could bring against men that had sex with each other, um, subsequent to the partial decriminalization in 1967, which decriminalized um, sex between men. But there were still these other laws on the books, which there are still today. In time. Mm form indecent exposure and importuning um, and so the police had continued to persecute for doing that um, with each other um, and then HIV AIDS happened and then people started moralizing and say you know in in the in politics and in the media about saying you know like well gay men we've always known that they're bad really and now they're bringing this this plague on themselves they're not looking after each other they're potentially going to infect the general population they're mm. going to children because they're also all paedophiles um and so that gradually that hostility and that fear and that moral panic grew from the 80s um culminating in the passage of the first piece of anti-gay legislation for more than 100 years which is you know section 28 in the uk which banned public authorities from acknowledging homosexuality so there was this huge like swarm of um of hostility in the 80s and popper's and the story of pop is just fed into that because when you look at the newspaper coverage of HIV and AIDS or of of anything to do with poppers, then they are completely connected um, because you know there, there were people saying, well, poppers, well, you know, maybe it's poppers that's causing HIV and AIDS because yeah. it's only the gay pe people that are getting sick and it's only the gay people that sniff poppers, um, and poppers make you a whore, and if you're a whore, then you're more likely to get HIV, and um, and so this is bad, 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 you know? So these things were all connected. Um, and then sort of some, you know, gross newspapers did, did some gross stories where they did like a sting, you know, kind of um, hanging outside the Royal Vauxhall Tavern and um, hearing people talk about poppers going in and then seeing that poppers were on sale in that pub and therefore saying, you know, this pub is selling this horrible thing, mm. et cetera. And then obviously they go on, they they kind of invade this space, right? And then and say, they raided, them, yeah, they, yeah, they raided the RBT and other pubs as well, and they yeah. took things from them uh, because there was this, uh, th th you know, they 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 knew the police knew that they would have the support of the general public and therefore the right, basically the right wing media, um, like um, the Sunday Times and um, the News of the World that had covered the covered these things in this way. Um, and so, yeah, they, they went in and they seized poppers on the grounds of um, it being a noxious substance, which is like this, um, you know, Victorian law about poisons, basically. And so they were saying, you know, and they ended up, you know, the, 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 um, the bar staff and the landlords at the Royal Vauxhall Tavern in, um, in London were charged with selling a poison, um, mm. basically, which is hilarious because they weren't charged with 
selling the poison, which is alcohol. Alcohol and the cigarette machine. (laughs) Which is like cigarettes in the corner. Exactly. These are also poisons. And actually alcohol is like, and cigarettes are like so much more harmful for your health than... Yeah, for sure. (laughs) I mean, mean, it's just what it reminded me of was the way that um, the selling of, uh, of, of drugs and the association of a substance mm-hmm. with uh, a, an, a kind of an, an identity or if we were being yeah. more academic, we'd say so like a subject, subject position yeah. um, that is undesirable, yeah. right? And then using this as a kind of organizing principle. And, and this, I mean, at one point they said the reason they invaded was to check whether there are any drunk people in there, which I swear yeah, exactly. is the start of a joke. <laughs> yeah, exactly. um, Let's go and uh, see in this pub if there's any drunk people. <laughs> <laughs> well, what about the other 5,000 pubs within the same square mile? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's, also, yeah. I mean, the, the playbook, you know, it's a standard playbook because they did that in 86, 87. Um, and then literally within uh, probably f- like three or four years, uh, the police um, and the media were uh, the right-wing media were colluding to do exactly the same thing with ecstasy and rave culture. Is that true? I'm, yeah. yeah, of course, yeah. because, you know, rave culture was basically like young well, people that were um, especially, you know, that were going into warehouses, setting up their own parties without licenses, um, taking ecstasy, uh, having a right old time. It was all about love and community and everything. And then the police, just, you know, and then, um, the media just started saying, you know, these are bad people. They're bad kids. They're doing drugs. It's, you know, it's really, it's really bad. And they're breaking into like warehouses, which are not otherwise being used and having these giant parties or fields or forests or whatever. Um, and so they made like, they, they made a, you know, like um, a scapegoat, like a, ho- like a horrible oh. figure in society of like young people that were, that were doing raves and taking ecstasy. And um, obviously then, you know, you know, there was there were a very tiny number of young people that took an ecstasy pill, had a bad reaction, uh, and died, unfortunately. And that just really fueled the, the moral panic and the hysteria around it. And so, yeah, the police just like basically destroyed the rave scene um, yeah. because they just turned them into riots. You know, the police just invaded with riot gear and started hitting people and arresting them, and yeah. turned what was basically like a you know a really great loving nightlife scene fueled by MDMA, which is which is a love drug, you know, turned that into um, a horror show. And yeah. it was the same playbook. I wonder whether, whether there was any, it'd be interesting to trace whether there were any particular, whether there was like a direct link between what they'd done with poppers and then what they did on a much more industrial scale because it was more across the country with rave culture. Um, yeah. Whether any police officers that had been involved in the first one also were involved in the second one. Yeah. No, I, I mean, it would, be, it, would be, it would be surprising if there weren't, I suppose. Mm. I, mean, I mean, what struck me there is that, the, I mean, Poppers obviously it's a, like a 45 second thing. and Ecstasy mm. is much longer. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but of, but the kind of the effects are not dissimilar, right? Um, uh, and, and there's this kind of, I, I don't know whether there's this, the, you know, what gets police, the substances that get policed are the ones which, um, yeah. which do what you, I mean, potentially moving towards kind of, um, thinking more kind of in the future, yeah. um, the the kind of the the mental effect that poppers has yeah. on, on on you. I mean, you yeah. talk about it as a kind of antidote. It's this interesting moment where you you know um, the relation between cyanide uh, and uh, and poppers as two things which either take or receive oxygen. I mean, in yeah. what sense do you mean when you say like poppers is an antidote? To the science. Well, yeah, I mean it. I mean it in two different ways. Um, in a real practical way, which is that um, amyl nitrite is literally an antidote of cyanide in the human body. If you take, if you, if you're affected by cyanide, you're poisoned by it because it stops your, um, it stops oxygen binding to your blood cells. So it has a really quick effect. So definitely, if you want to kill someone, poison them with cyanide. Um, <laughs> that's why it's in like all the great spy novels and stuff like that and it's because it's really quick and effective um but pop and you know cyanide is a is a substance that's produced in a lot of industrial processes so a lot of factories have amyl nitrite on uh like in stock as an antidote um because that um can basically stop the cyanide uh doing its job of of binding to the red blood cells to stop the oxygen binding. It can, if you snip amyl nitrate, it somehow arrests that process. Um, and so uh, so it is an antidote to, to something that can kill you, which 
and well, that was just a, a surprise discovery. Yeah, that is, it is really interesting. And I was looking into it and I was like, oh my God, that's great. And then I was like, oh my God, metaphor, you know. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so it works on the second level for me anyway, which is the metaphorical level of like, you know, the fact is, you know, when I sniff poppers, um, it because it produces this much more like sexualized, um, horny, uh, uh, version of myself which is kind of forgetting for a moment forgetting uh, like the, the the this 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 panic that I have about like am I am I enough am I sexy enough am I a man enough am I queer enough uh, am I a human enough um you know what is he gonna think of me like oh my god all that rubbish that we don't need you know because it just like goes like woof puts you into a sexy zone for 45 seconds or a minute, it removes all those things. And I think those things are the poisons, you know, the shame and the stigma, um, they're, they're kind of like, they poison us. And so I was like, okay, so it's also working in a sort of, well, it's a metaphorical, but it's kind of political, philosophical, spiritual sense as well. Um, and so when I kind of discovered that metaphor, I was like, well, obviously I'm gonna write a whole chapter about that because that's fun to think about yeah i mean it's it's and it's it seems related to this um opposition that you make between kind of thinking and feeling um mm -hmm. this idea that queerness is not there to be identified with or mm -hmm. thought mm -hmm. um, but rather felt which is important because i feel that certainly a lot of people understand queerness as lumped under this thing called identity politics and people yeah. don't you know tends to be a pejorative these days yeah. Yeah. Um, and what, but it does seem that there's a kind of opposition to identity politics in in your text here, in a more, in a, of course, in a more, uh, in a way that it does use it in its pejorative sense so much. Yeah. I wonder, um, first of all, what is that politics of feeling uh, and a queerness based on feeling, and mm -hmm. what is it poppers that's informing that, um, <laughs> or is it using it as a, are you just using it as a metaphor? I mean, I think I am using poppers to, um, or, or, and some of the discoveries that I made about what poppers is as a substance and how mm. we've all collectively experienced it like through history and also as a community of queer people or as a community of gay men. Um, and I do broadly identify as a gay man, although I say like, I'm a gay man. <laughs> Cause I'm like, I don't really know uh, what those are. And that's why I just say like, I just, I just call myself queer and be done with it. Um, because like, you know, fuck your labels. And so, um, yeah, so I'm using it um, and it's and the experience that we've had um, of it within a, a community to kind of like make a point, um, which is, you know, taking some of those things that it, the, you know, the real parts of, of its history and the real like chemical things and the bodily things that it does to you, taking those real things and then using them to explore those ideas um, and explore the those those philosophies and politics. And so, yeah, there is a bit of an opposition to identity politics going on in the book it's it's interesting to hear you say that explicitly because um it's i didn't say that explicitly in the book but i agree with you that it's there and although a lot of people have asked me about who read the book or have done interviews like this with me have talked to me about this they haven't said that ex explicitly in that way and so i think that that's i'm glad that you said that um and I wonder whether it's because, you know, like on the left and in, within queer circles and queer politics, it's like um, you're sort of, you know, we have to defend identity politics like all the time. Um, and but I think that that misses the, the fact that there are drawbacks to identity politics. You know, mm. we have to defend identity politics because, of course, a person, a person's full rights and dignities on the basis of their identity should be respected and uh, and um, and protected, right? You know, those protected characteristics, you know, your age, your gender, your sex, and your race, uh, your ethnicity, all those things, um, you know. But I do also think that there is a drawback to us structuring our politics and our rights-based system uh, with that, because when it comes to sex, um, sexuality, and gender, um, what we know is that these things are really um, only ever able to be expressed with with words and um, 
in a you know only up to 80 percent really cl- you know clarity really you can't mm. there's, there's there's so much more to the experience of of being uh, a man than is captured in the word man um and protected in the word man and also um you know there's that smooshy space between the concept of man and the concept of male you know um and then that's just and I'm just talking about those tiny little things. And then there's like a hundred other genders and a hundred je- sexualities. And so like, there's so much that we just cannot express. Um, and that's why I talk about feeling because I think that the feeling is the most Im- important thing. I mean, when you talk to people about their sexual, how they, you know, we, ha- what their sexuality is, what their gender is, what their sex is. Um, so much of what they say is really down to like how they feel in their body. Um, and and sometimes that's like an internal thing, and sometimes it's a relational thing. Mm. And so I think that um, we uh, need to we we need to be thinking more about how we respect people because of like what they're feeling um, about themselves and their bodies. Um, and obviously that that for example, you know, that is in my opinion the root of um, the kind of gender politics that I want to see, which is. Uh, you know, self-definition um, mm. gender, which obviously is a is a particular policy that affects trans people, um, and it's a particular policy that um, most trans people, you know, call for. Um, but it also has implications beyond trans people. Like it's, you know, I think I believe in self-definition. So, um, uh, yeah. So I think that that's kind of that's I don't that's how I ended up going up down that rabbit hole really, just by sniffing poppers and thinking about this. Yeah, um, it, I mean, it was something which I, I I thought was really striking because I, I it seemed to me that identity politics started being something that uh, queer people especially were being accused of participating in, and then the kind <laughs> yeah, of retrospectively, it's become, dirty, it's become a dirty strategy. It's like it's like yeah. funny because, because I think like you know historically, you know the the the, the groups that have um, benefited from the protection of. Um, identity characteristics. Those groups are the ones that have like have basically called for identity politics in yeah. you know in 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 name or or, or otherwise. Mm. Where they said you know please you know you have to respect me and give me my rights on the basis of these prote- these these components of my identity right yeah. and that's the politics. So we've done that um, and it has improved things a lot. You know you know New Labour brought us the Human Rights Act and employment law which protected our characteristics. Um, and then that's also the same in an international, not sorry, not the same in all levels, but like that's been a, a powerful force internationally and within the gay rights movement and the, you know, LGBT history movement, it's been a hugely important force. Right. Yeah. Um, but, but, the, but what the right has now done has, um, shifted that back at us and saying, you know, like that's a, uh, you know, that's, um, a, a fucked up. Um, strategy what you're calling you're calling for too much you're you're like not being rational you're um you're breaking down what it means to be human and of course people on the left are going like well yeah that is what we're doing um we, you know we're trying to say like you know people are complicated and you need to give people their rights because of who they are um but now we can't call that we can't say that we're doing this on the basis of identity because the right are saying that it's that you know the right are fighting us on that front and so i think that and and you know yeah, it, it, the right is doing it to just drive a wedge between different groups. It's a classic, you know, divide and conquer thing. Um, and I, and currently the left, as far as I can tell, does not have, and the LGBTQ plus movement does not have a, um, a replacement grand idea. Uh, you know, I think we've had identity politics for, um, you know, for, I don't know, 50, 60 no, yeah, 60 years or something, 70 years maybe, probably since the 50s when the gay rights movement, the modern gay rights movement started, and then really since 69 with Stonewall. Yeah. Yeah, but but I think that it's it's probably run the end of its road because the right has found a successful way mm. of, um, of defeating it. So so I think that there's something more that we have to think more about feeling but um, and, and, and the fluidity of things, and, and, and I think that's where it is, but... I, I kind of I stop. I'm not clever enough, you know. I stop short of like actually proposing, like, okay, left, okay, queer politics. This is how we do it, you know. Mm. That's what, well, I'm just the book is more of a dream, you know, the book or a fantasy. Um, it's it's not so much like a concrete manifesto or human manifesto. 
But isn't I mean, but isn't the point of your position perhaps that we should stop for stop short of a concrete manifesto? Mm, mm. That in so in so far as what is interesting about the history of poppers uh, and to an extent the history of sex is are those are those gaps? <laughs> There's an attempt a demand right, uh, which you kind of, which gets leveled at the left especially which is what is the utopia that you want mm. to, to demand an answer to that question right yeah you know, in you know david cameron would always say how are you going to pay for it or something like that yeah um uh uh to which the answer is i didn't say i was going to pay um but um but the what seemed to me to be the lesson uh, at the end or the t- takeaway that i had mm. was that we shouldn't actually uh think of that question as one that needs answering yeah. and more one that just needs responding to in the form of action. Well, I uh, guess yeah, conducting because conducting ourselves as people. Yeah. I think that's, I think that's true. And because I guess, um, yes. Uh, yeah. There's two things going there. I'm not, I'm not producing a concrete manifesto in the book. One, because of what you said, because I don't think it's the right, I, I guess underneath, I don't think it's the right strategy and I'll go on to exactly what I think it should be. Um, but also too, because I don't work in that, in that field, like that, my, the you know, my field is culture um, mm. and arts. And so for me, it, I'm, I, I am concentrating my time and my days and my energies and, um, and building my networks and collaborations and stuff around, um around culture and arts um and that's why i'm more working on the on the battlefield of feeling if you like because i think Mm. that you know i'm trying to give people feelings i'm trying to help them feel the things that they feel by um writing a book in this case which externalizes something that they may have felt about themselves you know i'm 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 exploring in the book the concept that i am a gay or or a man um, and I'm saying that I don't really feel like either of those, even though most people would look at me on paper and say, that's what I am. Mm. And so I don't really feel those. I feel these other things. You know, I also feel slutty and I also feel like more, like sometimes more female than male or in particular moments or whatever that even means. And so I guess I'm saying like, if I'm, if I'm able to like externalize a feeling that I'm having and then connect with a reader who may feel the same way or not the same way, but be able to realize something about their in- interiority that is now externalized because I said it, um, or I get, or I gave them sort of, or they feel that I gave them permission to think about themselves in that way. Then, then that's really what I'm trying to do. And it's the same with, you know, the podcasts that I make or other things that I might make or write is, um, it's working through, like through creativity um, and stories, um, and so it's using culture uh that's my that's my political battleground and um it does stop short of making a particular manifesto or running for office or something like that um and uh yeah (laughs) yeah it's making me think about what the hell am i doing and why well only because of your book did the same for me but it's like my annual review or something yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, that's what that's what this is. I thought, yeah, yeah. Um, do, I no, get a rent? do I get a pay rise? Uh, <laughs> I unfortunately can't afford that. Um, <laughs> um, but I, um, I don't know. I mean, we probably need to sort of find some way to wrap up because mm-hmm. the time has flown. But mm-hmm. I, I, I just wanted to maybe finish um, on a similar note, which is to talk about your claim that the future is who we become in the next 45 seconds, <laughs> uh, um, which I really liked. I, I sort of get the sense or got the sense from the way that you wrote it, that it was, you know, you're having a bit of fun, uh, mm-hmm. but I wonder how serious uh, you take that claim and, uh, and how seriously you think we, we should kind of cl- take that claim. But yeah, uh, I think, yeah, yeah it's, uh, I, you're right. It, it's kind it is sort of tongue in, tongue in cheek. Um, but it, it works for me on a couple of different levels. W- number one, within the book, forty-five seconds is the um, is the length of time that I'm saying that like a popper's rush really that works for. You know, sometimes it's a bit longer, and it's different for different people. So, um, and the point is, in that moment, you have stripped away those poisons that we mentioned earlier, and you are like a purer, in some ways, a purer version of yourself, which in this case is like sexual. 
and um, relational to like, you're much more in relation to your own body. And if you're with another person or persons like than with them, you have this like great sense of community with them. <laughs> it's a really funny way of describing sex, but, um, <laughs> but yeah, so you have that. And so yeah. like, you know, that's a 45 seconds that I want to live in where yeah. I have like a, like a destigmatized relationship with my own body um, and a more communal moment with my fellow person um, that's in front of me. And so um, I kind of, I think, you know, it's one of those things where like, oh my God, if only we were all able to like be more like that all the time, then, you know, we wouldn't, um, we wouldn't be invading countries and we wouldn't be doing toxic behavior in the workplace to each other, um, et cetera. And we, and we wouldn't be feeling shit about the bodies that are carrying us around because, um, because we wouldn't have the shame and stigma of those things. Mm. So, so it's, so it works in that sense, but also I hadn't really thought about this when I was writing it, but because you asked me about this and, um, you were particularly taken by that, I thought it's also kind of like a, it's, it's kind of a canny way of basically saying like live in the present, even though it's t pretending to be about the future. Um, and it's saying the next 45 seconds, obviously that's, that's hardly any future at all. Um, and so it's more about like, you know, it's a bit like the time is now, like, what can you, what are you going to be doing in the next 45 seconds? You know, which is basically like, if it, what can you, what can you actually do? Well, I can like go and cook my pasta right now, or I can like jump on that bus to go to that thing. Like, um, yeah. So I, I think it's more like, it's a, it's a way of like living in the future, uh, living in the now. Um, but with this, um, concept of the future as being something that's worth thinking about and worth striving towards you know it's like the next step you know like after a meeting you're like oh my god we've got to do all these different things um uh, and it seems undoable so therefore like what's our next step what's the what's the one thing that we're all going to be able to do from now from now on that starts us on that big long complicated journey of doing a thing um and i and i guess that's a useful way of of living i don't know whether this is becoming like a sort of like a life management consultation workshop but you know if people need that kind of thing then sniff poppers and use google tasks